Good morning, good afternoon and good evening ladies and gentlemen. We would like to extend a very warm welcome to each one of you at the nice global conclave from the laps of the beautiful Himalayas where the Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement is located. The think tank was established in the month of February in the year 2016. It undertakes independent research in the field of international relations, foreign policy, security studies and development. NICE has four research centers: China Studies, Neighborhood Studies, Non-Traditional Security Studies and Security and Strategic Studies. The institute focuses on eight research topics: climate change and energy, global governance, sustainable development and smart cities, refugee and migration, China's Belt and Road Initiative, border and transboundary water politics, Indo-Pacific affairs, disaster management, and international economy and development. Previously, Nice has had the opportunity to host distinguished speakers from all around the globe. It was a great pleasure inviting me to speak here at Nice. It's a real pleasure to be able to speak with all of you. Well, thank you anyway, and I certainly admire the work that you're doing. Uh, I'm very happy to be with you all. Nice Global Conclave is the flagship event of Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement. The theme of the 3-day conference is connecting Nepal to the world with the aim to bring leaders, diplomats, business leaders and scholars from all over the globe. The objective of the conclave is to introduce Nepal to the world and at the same time update the Nepalese policy makers and experts about the fast changing geopolitics which will help Nepal reshape its foreign policy to achieve its national goal. <coughs> this is the H session of the conference and this session is supported by United Service Institution of India. to chair and moderate this session it is a real pleasure to have with us lieutenant general g s katoch lieutenant general gansham singh katoch has held a number of prestigious command and staff appointments in his service he retired in march 2016 as director general strategic planning Presently he is the head editorial team at the United okay. Service Institution of India New Delhi Without any further ado I request the chair to take over Uh thank you so much for that uh, very generous introduction and uh, before uh, I start off let me also uh, just mention one fact about the think tank that I uh, belong to the United Service Institution of India that uh, uh, it's india's oldest think tank established in 1870 and last year we celebrated a 150th year of course amidst the covid so the celebrations were a little muted and uh, of course uh, we are starting off now ses- session uh, h of uh, this uh, the nice conclave and the topic for this session is enhancing cooperation between the bbin countries uh, to give us our views on this subject uh, we have a very eminent panel Uh, we have ambassador farooq shoban for former foreign secretary of bangladesh lieutenant general k j singh uh, former indian army commander he commanded the western army command major general a k m abdul rahman uh, who is a former director general of the bangladesh institute of international and strategic studies major general binoj basnet of the uh, who is a strategic analyst on south asian affairs from nepal and mr lobzang dorji who had not joined us uh, as yet but i'm sure he will join us who is a associate lecturer at the shirbutse college university of bhutan of course uh, uh, the uh, the brochure that the nice had sent out 
had a very detailed introduction to all the speakers but i have been given directions that to save time i should not uh, you know repeat that and uh, hence uh, people who are listening in uh, they would be advised to look at that and you will find that each one of the speakers has got a very very uh, distinguished career a very very solid background uh, to talk on this particular subject and uh, without further ado i will i will follow the uh, sequence of speakers generally the way it was there on the flyer so we will have first ambassador uh, farooq shoban followed by lieutenant general kj singh then major general uh, rahman major general basnat and mr lobzang dorji and i'm sure by that time he would be in and uh, uh, the format that i have been told is that uh, you should uh, stick to about 8 uh, to 9 minutes uh, in your uh, presentation uh, or uh, the talk that you are giving and uh, thereafter at the end of that uh, we will take on any questions which come in and i would also have a couple of questions to ask the uh, the panelists distinguished panelists so without further ado may i request ambassador farooq shoban to give his presentation uh, over to you sir Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I hope uh, I'm audible. Uh, <clears throat> yes, you are. Yes, you are. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank uh, Nice for inviting me to this annual conclave. Uh, I'm uh, extremely happy to uh, share my views with you uh, regarding enhancing cooperation among BBI and countries. So. uh by a happy coincidence uh i was there at the birth of bbin uh it came out of a ministerial decision uh taken in may 1996 that resulted uh in a formal decision taken at the male summit in early 1997 and that was followed by the first meeting of the four foreign secretaries of bbin uh namely uh, uh bhutan bangladesh india and nepal it took place in kathmandu in, in may of 1997 uh that meeting was uh, supported by the asian development bank uh, the model which we used uh, at that time was uh, the mekong delta project that was uh, promoted by uh, the asian development bank as the ideal format for uh, the four bbin countries to to follow uh, unfortunately uh, the uh, initial uh, enthusiasm uh, for bbin which in its initial uh, formative period was known as the growth quadrangle uh then ran into some uh, difficulties uh, i think uh, india had some second thoughts about it uh, and then uh, there was also we were planning to do this uh, within the sarc framework which allows uh, two or more countries to work together on specific projects uh, so there was also objection to uh, the growth quadrangle uh, by pakistan uh so this uh, resulted in uh, for a extended period of time uh, the asian development bank undertook studies uh and supported uh, a framework of consultations involving the business community of the four countries uh more recently uh this proposal was revived and all the four countries uh today now support uh the bbin framework uh the focus of bbin uh has really zeroed in on uh, three very specific areas uh, energy connectivity and and trade and investment uh, i think one uh, we have seen uh, substantial progress uh uh in the area of connectivity and energy cooperation and i would also add trade and investment uh bilaterally between uh, india and bangladesh and also in in the case of uh india and and bhutan and uh, 
and also India and, and Nepal. The challenge has been to really bring all four countries as active participants into this process. Uh, so the three key initiatives that have been taken uh, really, one was the Motor Vehicles uh, uh, Registration Act, and uh, we got uh, an agreement initially of all the four BBIN countries, uh, but as uh, is well known, uh, Bhutan has uh, opted not to ratify this agreement. Uh, there is a discussion that uh, we should move forward uh, initially without Bhutan and that perhaps Bhutan will join later. Similarly, in the case of energy cooperation, there have been discussions about trilateral cooperation involving Nepal, Bhutan, uh, Bangladesh and, and India. Uh, but uh, the uh, format that this has taken is that Bangladesh would like to import hydroelectric power from Bhutan so, uh, and from Nepal. So the idea is to develop and design uh, a trilateral agreements between uh, Nepal, India, and, and Bangladesh, and between Bhutan, India, and, and Bangladesh. Uh, these discussions are underway. I think one, uh, we have seen substantial progress in connectivity uh, between Bangladesh and uh, India, as I mentioned. What the challenge now is uh, to bring uh, Nepal and uh, Bhutan into uh, this uh, framework of, of connectivity, both by rail as well as by road. Uh, whereas there have been agreements in principle, uh, the challenge today, as I see it, is uh, uh, implementation. Uh, particularly across the, the chicken's neck. Uh, we understand India has some uh, sensitivities on, on uh, grounds of uh, security. Uh, so we need to look at ways of, of uh, moving forward uh, uh, in the area of connectivity so that Nepal and Bhutan are, are more integrated with the uh, transportation uh, network across India into Bangladesh. Uh, I see uh, enormous uh, prospects for uh, cooperation in the future, but uh, I would say that, uh, and I'm concluding here, uh, and I hope we can take up some of these points uh, in due course, uh, we need to see the, uh, the business community uh, more proactive. Uh, one challenge is, is uh, the fact that uh, we have uh, uh, four countries with, uh, uh, I would say, substantial differences in terms of uh, the size of their uh, economies. But the whole idea here was uh, to focus on geographical contiguity. So when we speak of India, we are really speaking of uh, West Bengal and, and uh, the Indian Northeast. Uh, as the major beneficiaries of this uh, process. So I hope uh, in our discussions, uh, we can uh, look at ways and means of uh, taking these various initiatives uh, forward. I'll stop here now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Shoban. Thank you so much uh, for this very short and crisp uh, you know, discourse. And, uh, you know, you mentioned about the sensitivity of the chicken neck area. And of course, our next speaker, uh, who prior to becoming the Army Commander, Western Command, had looked after that particular area as part of his duties as a core commander there. Uh, during his discourse, uh, maybe he will throw some light on that. And as you very rightly brought out, uh, that West Bengal and India's Northeast are actually the uh, very major beneficiaries of this uh, particular initiative and uh, hence uh, the importance of uh, the initiative being successful. Uh, so with this over to uh, Lieutenant General KJ Singh. Uh, good morning, everybody. And let me use an expression which probably is understood, hopefully in uh, the other countries which are part of BBI and Suprabhat. We are looking at East. We are talking East and we are acting East. 
so here we are talking to firstly uh, a very eminent panel so i am very humbled to be in their presence i am grateful to the chair uh, general katoch who's been my very valuable colleague in my service career has always helped me along and above all we are grateful to nis and usi which is hosting this session so with these words of gratitude let me start off the discussion uh, i'll be uh, uh, i'll be failing in my duty if i didn't thank ambassador farooq subhan because he set the agenda and since he was there in the inaugural uh, deliberations and setting up of this body so he was probably may not be planned but best suited to give the context of historical uh, emergence of this propit so now as a soldier let me uh, do a little bit of reality check because there is an institution which came up 15 years nearly 15 years back it is a quadrilateral and there have been attempts sometimes to attach sri lanka and maldives with it and now there is even talk that better than sri lanka and maldives probably one should attach thailand and myanmar which are uh more sort of relevant to this kind of connectivity or corridors so whether this quadrangle becomes quadrilateral becomes a hexagon or not but there is a need to do a reality check because 15 years down the line we have very little to show and prove see uh there are other organizations which were there they have managed to set up their headquarters they have more institutionalized discussions here the joint working groups are meeting very irregularly they meeting after a gap of 3 to 4 years last time they met was i think in 2016 if i am not wrong and uh, diplomats are gifted and so is our ambassador subhan who can help you to see light at the end of very dark tunnel and he has actually because one should not lose hope after all we have to work in that direction so what are, what is this hesitancy all of it basically this feeling that india is a huge big country and there's always this certain desire certain expectancy from india there is certain amount of apprehension but we are very lucky that bangladesh is also emerging as a tiger economy and bangladesh is Uh, today in a process in in a in in a situation to give foreign exchange aid to sri lanka for their currency swap agreement so if bangladesh is gaining this kind of heft and today economical heft is a very major th- major issue so it is hoped that bangladesh will firstly it has excellent relations with india now will help to balance out this uh, so called uh, fear of uh, india dominating it and now that india is once again starting to engage with pakistan there is also hope that india is able to convince pakistan that acting east is something totally di- different from our overall relationship under sarc or maybe even bimstek because uh, even pakistan would realize that while they were attached to a country uh, called as you know they called it east pakistan but then geographical compulsions language culture it was a very artificial construct so india is also a huge big country it has got its own dimensions and east has got its own relevance i do take ambassador subhan's point that while it is meant for northeast unfortunately i'll be a little critical it is all controlled from delhi so there is a need to take counsel from what he is saying is there a need to steer this from the northeastern council or at least give the ownership of this to donair department of northeast uh, give it to them they broadly structure all articulations and discussions and foreign ministry keeps an overwatch because ambassador subhan will also he is himself a foreign office uh, foreign service official 
he will also not like to give away his stuff so easily. But can this stuff within India get shared to the relevant department and steered from there? Now, uh, India's uh, major, see, two countries here are landlocked. They need the transit. They have some existing arrangements and they need to be improved. Coupled with this is a problem that Bhutan does not want to suddenly open up to outsiders. Bhutan follows an excellent logic of uh, low impact, high value uh, engagement. So what basically it means is even in tourism, you allow a fixed number of tourists to come in, you charge them certain premium, and you preserve your e ecosystem, your ecology, and do not get it ruined. Uh, we can do a comparison of say Gangtok and of Bhutan. And you will realize that in Gangtok, the number of tourists which uh, we are trying to now learn from Bhutanese model. So there is, in such fragile kind of ecosystems, there is a need to regulate the number of people. So Bhutan's hesitancy is understood, but mechanisms have to be found to get over it. Because see, after all, the showpiece of this entire uh, grouping, the motor vehicle agreement, is not getting fully operationalized. It is one thing to do it between three countries, but it is it is a huge big achievement to have all four on board. So uh, we hope we are able to get over it. I must also spend about three four minutes, which I have now, on Siliguri corridor. See, like China has got this Malacca dilemma, India has got this corridor dilemma. Uh, this corridor does enhance vulnerability for India, though India has mechanisms, uh, India has strategic storages, India has excellent relations with Bangladesh, and it is able to uh, develop connectivity through Bangladesh. But India's <laughs> desire is, and so of other countries is, that transit should convert into economic corridors. It should become friendship corridors. So India would like to uh, use that. Siliguri is an excellent city, but underdeveloped city, not fully developed. If all four countries invest and take joint ownership of this uh, famous uh, construct, which was once rooted and discussed, that uh, there is uh, a need to have Funchling, which is Jaigaon Funchling complex in Bhutan, and Viratnagar in Nepal, Panchgad in Bangladesh, and Siliguri as a BBIN economic zone, and have Panchgad as the headquarter of BBIN. It's an excellent concept. It needs to be taken forward. Now, what does Siliguri offer? Siliguri has got uh, tremendous avenues for education. You have hill schools in Darjeeling and Kalimpong. Uh, about 50% and more royalty and civil bureaucracy of Bhutan gets their education from there. You also have Manipal Engineering and Medical Colleges, which are there in Sikkim. And there is North Bengal University. More universities can come up in collaboration and cooperation. Uh, that apart, uh, there are excellent healthcare facilities. Uh, I know of Dr. Chang's hospital. Uh, there is uh, medical can develop as a, today also a lot of patients from Bangladesh, Nepal, and Bhutan come to Siliguri, come to Bagdogra airport, come to Siliguri and get treated over there. So healthcare or medical tourism is an excellent avenue which can be further developed. And it is also pharmacy. Yeah, there are the Sikkim has got excellent climate. There are existing units of Vokard and other uh, pharmaceutical companies, so they can be also developed. And you have few other industries like you have breweries, you have tea. So, and and some some I'm not so well up. Uh, Bhutan has got some breweries. Bhutan has got some uh, industries linked with tourism. Uh, similarly, uh, Nepal can develop. And this economic zone must come up. There is no doubt about this. And this can give us a huge big leg up. Disaster management is another thing which needs to be added to this package. Currently, it's not there, but it needs to be looked at. 
because these places have challenges in terms of uh, disasters. There have been earthquakes, there are cyclones. And if we share resources, if we share knowledge, it would be an excellent idea. Uh, I would uh, try and sum up to say that way forward is to develop container and rail-based connectivity about which some talk is taking place. Uh, there is a need to have some inter-parliamentary groups and chambers to interact more sort of formally, uh, get observers like Myanmar and Thailand, make it a, a hexagonal kind of an arrangement. And can we develop a vaccine development facility? Sikkim gives excellent uh, climate. There are pharmacies or pharmaceutical industries over there. Can it be ramped up to vaccine manufacture? And the last thing that I want to leave over here is that there is a great push from China to develop connectivity in this area. A uh, bullet train is coming up to Ningxi and uh, there is connectivity being de developed to Nepal. But allow me to submit it's an artificial kind of connectivity. Uh, connectivity. Uh, it'll all their manufacturing and everything would start from their uh, coastal region, eastern coastal uh, townships. And from there, it has to come all the way. There are logistic challenges. Much better connectivity can be developed here. Is there a point in looking at triple B uh, uh, W concept, which has been recently mooted, uh, building back better world, which is, was uh, mooted by Biden and uh, European Council to convince them to fund some connectivity projects here? Because even uh, Nepal, Bhutan, and Bangladesh will realize that strategic autonomy can only take place if you do not fully blank on China. I have nothing against China. They are an emerging power, but Humban Tota and few other examples must throw up question marks. Uh, uh, connectivity development has to be bottom, bottom up, has to be driven by the demand over here, and has to be owned by people of that region. And that certainly is not the case in the connectivity which is being developed by China in this region. With this, uh, I thank once again Jal Katoch and my fellow panelists. And uh, if there are any questions later, I'll try and take them. Thank you. Jai Hind. Uh, thank you, General KJ Singh. Thank you for that uh, discourse. And uh, of course, uh, you brought out uh, certain points. Uh, or I would say you threw light on points which are existing, uh, but which miss our uh, you know, focus because we get too carried away by the MVA, which is, of course, a very, very important thing. But it, it, we can't let it be the only thing of BBI. So, you know, when you talked about uh, some initiatives to make BBIN a little more concrete concept, like, uh, you know, a headquarter for the BBIN, uh, medical tourism, disaster relief, uh, you know, focus on that also within this, con uh, you know, construct, because that particular area, as you very rightly brought out, does see a number of natural disasters, and it uh, does need better coordination, which can uh, come through this platform. Uh, thank you so much. And now I will request uh, General Abdul Rahman to give his presentation. Over to General Abdul. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning to everybody. Especially, uh, I don't know how to address my teacher and professor and ambassador for so much that. So, only thing that I can say you, Salaam Alaikum, and good to see you after a long time. And uh, for the for the other panelists and also for the thank you people who are who are listening to me. Let me also confess it is very difficult to speak in the same panel where Farooq Subhansar is there because uh, uh, there are places where I uh, don't agree, but I don't dare to you know, say that. <laughs> but with his permission, I will be a little critical to some points. Anyway, I will start from where Jal Singh has ended. You know, he uh, brought the issues of you know, China. Actually, this is the main problem, according to my uh, understanding. Now, if you talk about the region, as you see, our region is one of the, it has a strong demand for greater integration, regional integration. And it has emerged as one of the fastest growing region in the world. We have one of the largest, you know, young population. And we are also having significant number of middle class consumers. 
but somehow it's despite the fact that the uh, the world bank south asia economy forecast forecasts that there will be about 7.2 percent of economic growth in 2021 yet there are you know problem because being despite being it's a dynamic region regrettably south asia is still one of the least integrated region or sub region what you call it and because uh, we have not made any progress the interregional trade which was around 5% about 15 years before uh, compared to 26% or more in the asean countries and our interregional trade is still 5% hovering around we really couldn't make much of uh, improvement so this is uh, one point where I, i'm a little you know at time disappointed or depressed all those uh, ambassador for civil said definitely because he had been a career diplomat and they will always speak positive but we being a military people we draw conclusion and we want you know solution very fast so by character we are different and uh, we don't really wait so long to implement anything we want very fast you know implementation of the project to my understanding there had been lot of initiative in our region it started with sar then we had bcmc then we have jan singh has said that we look east and connecting myanmar and also thailand with bbi and it is already there bimstek is already there myanmar and thailand is already with us with india bangladesh you know we uh, nepal we, it, it, these two countries are already there and then uh, we had the bcmc also there were road show also and then finally nothing really satisfied the general people like us we have not seen anything you know visible the way we had been dreaming uh, <laughs> i am in dialogue with a bangladeshi nepali and such like people but kapun dona jada zaruri hai sir shall i continue absolutely sir okay so uh, uh, so what i'm saying is that these are these are already there these are already there so we had uh, even a you know dhaka kunming uh, road show we had uh, also uh, a road show from uh, bangladesh to you know nepal and then the concept of mba motor vehicle agreement it was about to be ratified by all but suddenly then i understand because of the reservation from the bhutani test it has somehow you know did not progress but we really have not seen a completion of something very meaningful and concrete and there had been discussion that there are substantial progress in the region on the trade commerce especially in the energy sector but unfortunately these are bilateral india has this uh, you know uh, trade and uh, especially on the energy uh, connectivity with nepal india has with bhutan india has with bangladesh also but unfortunately you see bangladesh do not have with nepal and bhutan and our government had been desperately uh, you know uh, uh, giving op opening all door our parliament has have already given approval for using our port for all the four, four country all the three countries that we are talking about in india we talk about bhutan nepal so our, our door is always very very open and there is no need to justify how important is this connectivity just one example is that from the tripura capital agartala if you go to the calcutta port is about 1700 plus you know kilometer distance which can be traveled by only 200 km using the chitong port and and we say welcome despite the fact that our chitogong port is already overloaded because 90% of the trade goes through the chitogong port and still we are open we are trying to enhance the capacity we are trying to enhance the facilities we are trying to improve the management so that we can handle more container but the mentality 
of our government of our country is that okay we all want connectivity we all want to develop together but i understand as i said the main factor is the Shilibri corridor and and absolutely related to it is the perceived or real whatever you call it i am a military man i don't like to put a full stop there there is a strong sense of you know speculation from the uh, from uh, india about china that how china is going to behave and this and that so what we see in this region is there is always a counterbalancing you know there are always effort to bring more extra regional power to integrate than integrating into the regional you know countries or regional power i am not very sure how this uh, threat it is can, it can only be you know specifically addressed or said because i am not an indian man i am a bangladeshi man i understand the threat but how it can be you know taken care cannot be prescribed by me but it has to be prescribed by the india itself and there are many factors within india uh, which needs to be also considered there it, their foreign policy, their perceived threat, their even domestic policy. And Jan Singh has very rightly said that, look, the problem is with these uh, seven states or the seven states, but it is being controlled by the Delhi. So problem is on the East being uh, dictated by the West, something like what we have seen when we were part of Pakistan. We used to live in the East Pakistan but dictated by what Pakistan from there. So reality on the ground and the people's, you know, and people's requirement was, uh, was not taken care. Of. So I think this is one point, but of course, India cannot ignore. I don't say that it has to be, but if India makes an endeavor to see how it can balance the, the threat, it is, uh, uh, it feels from the regional power, and how much it can compromise, how much it can take care to give some space to implement the regional integration that we're talking. I will, I will say that there are traditional threats, there are non-traditional threats. Traditional threats is always there for even any country of the world. Any country which has a standing army, definitely he feels there is a traditional threat. But the non-traditional threat that we're talking about has to be, you know, it has to be minimized. And uh, I'm, 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 I'm very, uh, I'm not very disappointed, but I'm a little in an urgency to see some kinds of, you know, meaningful and visible improvement in the region integration before I die. I had been telling this thing for a long, long time. I will close by saying one small incident. Uh, I attended a uh, you know, UNESCO conference in Delhi. So one of the participants was the you know, chief of Pakistan Railway. So he sat with me in the breakfast table and he was telling me that he is facing a problem because he did not submit the yard ticket so the uh, host is in a, not in a position to help him. I said, what is the problem? He said, I have come by train. I have come from Punjab, you know? So, and he narrated how much time it takes. You see, the, the uh, uh, Wagga rail, railway station, and there is a village called, uh, uh, I forgot in the, which is very close, Closest to the, the Waga, opposite to the Waga, there is a small uh, village. The Atari, 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 Atari. Yes, sir. Thank you, thank you, sir. Atari. It takes not even one hour to take a goods from Atari to Waga or vice versa. But you see, because of the absence of protocol in the name of security, I would say I'm I'm, I'm a little tired of the word hearing the security because anything in that. Chief, uh, that railway chief says, sir, anything I take to connect in the name of security, it is being, you know, disapproved. What, what, 
we are living in the in the 21st century we have so much of device to you know you know detect anything which involves to which would give security problem but he still in the name of security we do we had this problem but i think i am very happy that i am being a bangladeshi proudly say back in to now uh, sir said about 1997 that is the time uh, there were some news whether bangladesh should be giving transit facility to india or not i can tell you there were hue and cry how come india will have transit india will pass through bangladesh and you know the it was something like you know a a, a crime but today you see bangladesh has opened everything have we are not facing any serious security challenges but the way it has been perceived so this has changed i think we have to change our mindset we have to find out how to mitigate and take the security to the different side and manage it and make some space for the trade commerce and integration bangladesh and india is having energy connectivity and this connectivity is still on 600 you know 600 megawatt one of the day i i said uh, some of the ambassador of india i said why 600 it should be more than few thousand we should connect the nepal we should connect the bhutan but unfortunately it is not because india itself import connect uh, you know electricity and as far as the per capita energy consumption in this region, in the BBI and region, we are one of the least in the world. But we have huge potential. But unfortunately, we can't make it. Well. So I think uh, let India, which is the most dominant player, we we all are the Nepal, Bhutan, Bangladesh. We all are player. But I understand that our you know capacity is far more less than India. So India has to take the leading role, how it can take care of its security, vis a -vis how it can integrate the region, not compromising its traditional security. With that, I would like to thank everybody. Uh, thank you, Jal Rahman. And uh, of course, uh, I, I would like to add here that uh, in this year, which is the 50th anniversary of the Liberation War, uh, we, we, we actually do feel proud to see Bangladesh performing so well, the economy performing so well, especially in uh, you know, certain sectors. And uh, if India is not performing as well in those sectors, it's a good thing because it should give us some, uh, some uh, incentive to try to do better. So it really makes us feel very proud. And you know the point that you gave about uh, uh, the lack of integration among the regional uh, you know, countries there uh, in the area that we are talking about, uh, getting affected by the uh, uh, the suspicion and rivalries uh, with extra regional powers. Uh, we should try to get over that. And as you rightly said, uh, if there's a spirit of compromise, give and take, uh, this thing can uh, be better. And of course, all this can only happen if we talk about it, if we meet in forums like this, and of course, uh, uh, more formal forums also. And uh, thank you so much. And now I will request uh, General uh, Binod Basner to give his presentation. Thank you, General Katoch. So it's uh, it's uh, pleasing to be part of the online discussions this morning with such prominent uh, speakers. Well, the countries in South Asia are more interconnected now, more interdependent, not just with the borders, but with civilization, strong culture, history, political economy, and the political security interests. So I would like to thank the NICE and the USI India for organizing this round table. So my discussion this morning will focus on the strategic and conceptual aspects of border management, border management of India and Nepal. So let me acknowledge five bullets. First is the geopolitical environment is variable and the world focuses on the Indo-Pacific region. So the IPR is the president's and South Asia is ever-changing. So national security and uh, regional security comes as a priority in the changing times and circumstances. Second, if South Asia is more strategic 
for the largest economies in the second half of the 21st century. Third, the risk of regional polarization, the stability of foreign policy amid political chaos, and competition creating an environment is challenge and vulnerability. So Indo-Sino dilemma in the Himalayas are evidences to protect Nepal's sovereign along China borders, which lies on the central subregion. So these incidents are linked with the geostrategic issues for long-term interests of great powers through battles are subsiding, but war endures. So small nations like Nepal in the changing Himalayan dynamic must be extra cautious on the geostrategic concepts that comes about by powerful nations and the strategic impacts that brings about and more importantly, this, this geostrategic reality. Uh, so let me um, highlight a few strategic happenings that has uh, uh, the strategic consequences. One is Nepal has witnessed the Maoist commit storm struggle that ended with a negotiated political settlement. And the other is Nepal's alterations of two federal, secular, and a republic uh, came with the 2015 constitutions, which has uh, promulgated by the majority of the legislatures, but uh, then they possess uh, the ownership by the Madesis, Danzatis, and the Thans. And the other is um, the anti Indian oratory of politics of convenience and conspiracy is also part of uh, the politics in Nepal. So these issues have been part of one, the domestic nationalism that the most nations are thriving forward with. And of course, two, the geopolitical transformations in South Asia, and three, unwanted advantages for state and non-state actors activities like illegal migration, narcotics stealing, smuggling, and other leading to questions of security. Now, let me examine the uh, uh, some doctrinal imperatives. One is the changed geography. The Himalayas and south of the Himalayas are formidably changed and it is more accessible due to variations of environment, infrastructure development and political interests and political will. The economic assistance and the military engagements are assisting for political influence uh, and strategic interests like the CPEC, the BRI and the uh, Himalayan multidimensional connectivity network and China Myanmar economic corridor and Bangladesh China India Myanmar economic corridor. So, this positions China's firmness and a will to be a bridge to the Indian Ocean. 80% of China's energy resources go through the Malacca Strait. So, second is the diverse geopolitical situation. So with the argument of the Himalayan regions of being even more significant, our geopolitical narratives can be assumed in the power competition, cooperations, and now confrontations between China and India in South Asia and the Himalayan region. Third is the great power rivalry is shifting in our part of the world. So the US national security policies, the US-China's rivalry are emerging in our region. So the border boundaries adjoining China along the Himalayas will therefore continue to be a matter of concerns to both China and India and the five nations that borders both big powers, including Nepal. Third, the geopolitical compulsions is visible. So values-based dimensions is also in roles. Democracy versus totalitarianism, communism is underway. Economy will continue to remain as a tool of national power. Military threats are more visible than before. Like the chief of the Indian Army, General Nirvana said, I quote, the region's security environment is characterized by Chinese belligerence in the Indo-Pacific, the rising footprints of China in India's neighborhood, and its attempts to unilaterally alter the status quo along our disputed borders have created an environment of confrontation and mutual distrust, unquote. So he suggests to increase connectivity in the Northeast 
and in neighboring countries to balance China's growing influence. Indication, China of making attempts to change the status quo. So fourth is the resource competition. And lastly is the weak governance system in Nepal. So with these strategic surroundings, the Nepal and India border is more sensitive than when the concepts of open border began after 1950s treaty. Today, the 145 land-based nations around the world, excluding the 50 islands and countries, 26% of 195 countries in the world employ three major international borders types, like 18 to 14% have open borders, 43, 45 persons have regulated borders, controlled borders, and 42 nations, like 22%, have 45 borders. So border types can be classified into soft, hard, and smart borders. Soft borders include open and regulated and controlled frontier. Hard borders referred to as fortified borders include wire-fenced borders, wire-fenced and wall borders. And uh, smart borders refers to information and communication technologies that enable uh, de-terrorized border controls. These are including biometric database and information sharing systems. So let me conclude. So one of the fundamentals of Nepal-India relations is, is politics of space with political interest, economy as a priority and security leverages for stability. There is also a shift in people's perception. Two, different forms of domestic nationalisms has been a trend in politics with ethnic nationalism, civic nationalism, cultural nationalism, religious nationalism, and anti-India oratory. Third, Incidents in the Himalayan region happens with an intent. Indication sent on possibilities. Nepal will have to look into the occurrences in the Himalayas with possibilities of long-term strategic impacts in the southern, east, and west borders. Four, Nepal must be very cautious with vital grounds that would assist heavy armaments maneuvering that are viability for Indochina confront. Small nations on the Himalayan arc are vulnerable. Militarily important grounds along the borders need to be identified and well protected today before controversy erupts. Nepal to safeguard its borders will be like an insurance in the years to come. Fifth, protecting Nepal's borders, land, air, and waterways from illegal movements of weapons, drugs, contraband, and people or migrations while promoting lawful entry and exit. In essentials for internal and security of both Nepal's immediate neighbors, economic prosperity and national sovereignty. A review and revisiting the state of border management is of great necessity. There requires to be a border management system in place with Nepal to adopt a separate border security force with professionals personnel, technology, resource, and critical security improvements to secure and manage our borders for long-term with immediate plans for execution. Today's model and modalities will not serve our interests, nor will it address security concerns. Sixth is the borders can be both open and secure, open to allow for a cross-border flow of legitimate trade and commerce, that is critical to Nepal and secure in the sense that the national security interests of states are protected. So the border security force must be committed to achieving a balance between the needs to maintain security interests, uh, cross-border threats and freedom of movement for persons, goods, services, and commerce. So amid an upheaval of unexpected situations as Nepal, the hurricanes of unreasonable behaviors by stakeholders. When fortune strikes against us, Nepalese, Nepal will have to remain unmoved, knowing that finally all will be well. One by one, creating a safer border environment. Two, making travel faster and the borders safer. Three, standardize secure identification. And fourth, collaborations with states and local law enforcement. So lastly, Nepal's interest and Nepal's territory integrity. Sovereignty comes first and foremost. Nepal today, with the major alterations in political, social, culture, system, and governments, 
to find out how she has stood proud today with the vibrant policies and the politics and administration system. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, General Bastet. And uh, uh, I'm sure everybody has benefited uh, from your uh, presentation. Uh, as I can uh, you know, make out uh, from your presentation or the first thought that comes to me, is that uh, you know in all these uh, deliberations when we talk of BBIN and we want to uh, come to a common platform uh, for uh, meeting our economic and interest for integration, the issue of sovereignty weighs on everybody's mind. And uh, sovereignty is such a concept that uh, nobody wants to lose any part of it, uh, even if uh, it, it is in return for certain. Uh, economic gains. Uh, what you mentioned about borders, soft borders, uh, hard borders, smart borders. So uh, how we manage our borders can also uh, give a big fillip to the sort of uh, integration that we are uh, seeking. Uh, say, uh, for example, like uh, say uh, the border between India and Myanmar. Uh, it's, a, it's a very odd border. It falls in all these three, uh, three zones. It is soft, it is hard, it is not so smart as yet because, uh, you know, uh, smartness in terms of uh, 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 modern communications or uh, uh, IT and such things are not uh, there to that extent. But it is soft and hard at the same time because from the time of the British, we had this, uh, you know, the uh, border trading regime where uh, because the communities were common on both sides of the borders, a person was permitted to carry for trade a head load across. So uh, as much as he could carry, so they, it, it would roughly be about 30 to 40 kgs. He can carry across up to a distance of about 10 kilometers without any customs, without any duties or anything. So it has helped those communities. It is soft to, the border is soft to that extent. But nevertheless, uh, that form of border has, uh, you can say, uh, it does not help uh, uh, to make the border secure uh, from insurgencies and uh, these sort of moments. So uh, whenever we talk of cross-border connectivity, the issues of uh, security of the borders uh, and at the same time, the sovereignty of the countries uh, is important. Uh, now I will, uh, I, I have Mr. Lobzang Dorji joined. Uh, anybody from NICE who can... Uh, no, sir. Yes, sir. So we cannot see him as of now. Okay, okay. So uh, uh, then uh, we are, uh, you know, going to miss a speaker from Bhutan. Would I have given the Bhutanese perspective? And uh, uh, I, I will just say a few words about that because I'm sure the thing that uh, it came out earlier also, which uh, is very evident, is that this, uh, the motor, uh, the MVA, uh, this, we call it a stumbling block, but we must understand Bhutan's, uh, you know, uh, it, its core values, its interests, that why it does not want to be part of that. And maybe one of the reasons is that, that it does not really gain too much from uh, this sort of agreement. That could be also a reason. If it was to gain a lot, maybe there would be some compromise. Uh, and uh, if they have, uh, you know, uh, problems about environmental damage, then they can be ways and means to uh, have more stringent norms of uh, emission of the vehicles which, say, move uh, to and fro uh, to help that. Uh, so, uh, uh, we'll now go on to the, uh, answer the questions. There are some which have come from the audience and uh, a few that I will have to ask. Uh, firstly, I will, uh, you know, ask some questions which have come from the audience. Uh, there is one from uh, Mr. Alok Bansal. I think Alok is uh, the uh, from the India Foundation, uh, if he is the same Alok. And uh, uh, he's asked a question which I am not very uh, clear about, but I'm sure uh, either Ambassador Shoban or uh, General uh, Rahman will be able to answer that. He's asked, what was the root of the Dhaka Kunming Roadshow? So I'm not very clear about the question, but uh, if it's clearer to you, I'd request you to answer them. Uh, either one of you or both of you. He's asked, what was the root of the Dhaka Kunming Roadshow? Over to you, sir. Uh, Ambassador Shoban first. Uh, I think uh, uh, probably General uh, Abdul Rahman is uh, 
better qualified to answer this, but uh, my recollection of this uh, was it started in Kunming. Uh, it uh, went through uh, uh, Myanmar uh, into uh, the Indian Northeast, then into uh, Bangladesh, and ended up in uh, uh, Calcutta or Kolkata. I think that was uh, the route, uh, the exact alignment of the route, uh, uh, I don't recollect. Uh, General Rahman, over to you. Sir, you are perfectly right, sir. It started from Kolkata, sir. It went through Dhaka, and then it went to uh, the Myanmar, and finally, it, the, there is a uh, border between uh, China and Myanmar. I visited the border also. I, I, I exactly can't remember right now the name. Uh, if, I, if I can recollect, I'll definitely share it. Uh, I, I visited the border also. So uh, uh, the route was very clear. The route was very, but there are problems. It was not a very smooth road, but uh, the effort was made. And um, uh, it was back in 2013, if I'm right. And there had been a lot of progress, and uh, it uh, the initiative was almost close to track uh, two level. Uh, you know, uh, and it was about to be. There was a scheduled meeting of the four countries in in Cox's Bazar of Bangladesh, but some or other, it, it was scheduled in 2014. But some or other, at the last moment, the meeting was postponed, and then thereafter, I saw no progress about the, uh, you know, BCIBC. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, the next question is from Nina, who asked that, what are the responsibilities and roles of the northeastern states of India in mitigating uh, or uh, improve, uh, moving forward this emerging relationship? And I will request uh, General K. J. Singh if he can give some views on that because uh, probably if we can uh, really come to a concrete thing that what are the northeastern states expected to do or maybe even I, I would say even uh, West Bengal what what uh, as we you know as it was brought out earlier that they are the states who are major beneficiaries out of uh, you know something like a MBA so what are the their responsibilities in mitigating this uh, relationship. And uh, after General KJ Singh has spoken, I would request uh, any of the speakers uh, from Bangladesh, if they can say that, what do they expect that these states should be doing? Uh, so over to General KJ Singh. Uh, thank you, General Katoj. And very wonderful question. I think, Naina, you have asked this question. A very appropriate question. The problem is there is a historical kind of a hesitancy. Uh, the headquarter of Eastern Command Till about 62 was that uh, it was located at Lucknow. And India thought that the East is where Lucknow is. So it shifted to Kolkata. And now there is a department. There is a Northeastern Council. They made their own plans. Those are funded also. There are priority projects also. But the interministerial coordination is a challenge. This is uh, the benign portion of my reply. Now let me do a lamenting portion of my response also. Uh, because this is an academic seminar and we should speak frankly and bring out issues which have implications. Within Northeast, there is uh, the core, which is uh, uh, the seven states, and then there is a linkage to West Bengal. Now, West Bengal uh, is a more advanced, more modern kind of a state. So it's uh, looking uh, for linkages, but not in, in, in a way that it is ideally desirable. It has to take greater ownership and it has to share the process. Now, even if you look at the Siliguri corridor, uh, Siliguri is located in Northern Bengal. Now, Northern Bengal is traditionally neglected by West Bengal. Because the focus of West Bengal is in Kolkata and it stops well short of Dinajpur. It doesn't reach Dinajpur in any case. So here this uh, formulation of North Bengal, which has uh, Darjeeling or Burkha Hill Council, it has got some 
sort of, uh, uh, I wouldn't say insurgency, but some sort of uh, kind of movement which is now being resolved in Kamsapur, Raja Bongshis and Kuchbihar area. Uh, so there are these duars, plains where tea labor lives. So there are conflicting expectations and requirements. They are not getting, in my perception, fully addressed in the formulation. And I have even uh, once written an article, by once, may more than once, and I have wondered that should North Bengal be a separate union territory, like Ladakh, which is now. And that will probably steer this process forward. But currently, it cannot happen. It has got caught in some internal politics, and it is seen in a very different connotation. When I wrote this article last year, both the parties which fought the election thought that through North Bengal, they'll win the West Bengal. Well, election results have done something different, and now it can't happen. But in longer time frame, uh, West Bengal should look at possibility of either giving North Bengal greater autonomy or making a union territory out of it. And then the ownership of this will become better. So I've been very frank. I've given you the benign official portion and also give you some laments which are in the environment. Thank you. I hope Thank I have you. answered the question. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, General KJ. And uh, sir, Ambassador Subhan, sir, can you, uh, anything from your uh, side on this issue? Uh, yes, uh, I'd like to uh, go back to uh, the genesis of uh, BBIN. The whole idea behind BBIN, because after all, we have SARC, uh, we have, uh, as uh, General Rahman mentioned, we also have BIMSTEC, uh, we also have uh, the Bay of Bengal uh, initiative, the Big B initiative. So we have, uh, we have BCIM. Uh, so what was really the rationale behind BBIN uh, when we, uh, uh, conceived this idea. It was to engage in project-specific cooperation. We would identify specific projects, whether it was in the energy sector, whether it was related to connectivity, uh, and we would then uh, uh, be able to do uh, projects which uh, might otherwise not have taken place. Now, as I have mentioned, we, we have seen uh, significant progress bilaterally uh, on projects between Bangladesh and uh, India. Uh, the challenge is to bring uh, Nepal and, and Bhutan into this process. Similarly, uh, the problem in the case of the Indian Northeast has been, and I've attended uh, two uh, annual uh, conferences organized by uh, the Ministry of uh, Northeast uh, Affairs uh, as a guest speaker, uh, has been uh, the uh, fact that at the end of the day, uh, all projects uh, need to go through an approval process in, in Delhi. Uh, I uh, was personally involved uh, while in the government. Uh, after retiring as foreign secretary, I was chairman of the board of investment. Uh, we uh, developed this uh, cross-border project to set up a fertilizer plant in uh, Silet uh, using uh, limestone from uh, uh, Meghalaya. Uh, this project, uh, the gestation period uh, extended to some three to four years uh, because it required the approval of, uh, of Delhi. The state government uh, was quite willing uh, to move forward, but the whole process was delayed. Uh, therefore, uh, I think the point which... Uh, uh, General Singh made was uh, a valid point that we need to perhaps uh, provide greater autonomy to uh, the Indian Northeast uh, to uh, move forward on specific uh, projects. 
We have seen, for example, uh, even now, uh, one of the barriers in terms of trade between uh, Bangladesh and the Indian Northeast has been uh, the uh, testing and certification process. Uh, uh, here, uh, the uh, uh, Northeastern uh, governments do not have the uh, authority to to do the testing and certification. Uh, this uh, uh, has to be done uh, through Delhi and, and this has also proved to be a, a bottleneck uh, to both trade as well as uh, investment. Uh, so I, I would say that uh, yes, if we want to see results, uh, we need to, uh, to give uh, greater flexibility uh, certainly to the Northeast. But let me also uh, very briefly uh, address uh, a key uh, issue in terms of energy cooperation involving uh, uh, the four BBIN countries. Uh, you know, if we are, for example, to do a big hydroelectric power project uh, with Nepal or with Bhutan, Bangladesh is very keen to do that. Uh, it raises the issue whether, uh, uh, the, how do we finance these projects? Can we bring in multilateral financing or foreign investment uh, to do these projects? Because uh, this too in the past has been a stumbling block. Uh, uh, India has had reservations about uh, involving foreign investment in uh, uh, energy projects involving uh, uh, Nepal and, and, and Bhutan. Uh, there have been reservations about uh, World Bank and, and ADB financing uh, in such projects. So these are issues, uh, frankly, uh, where uh, we need uh, to see India being more forthcoming and responsive in uh, allowing uh, projects involving both uh, uh, Nepal and Bhutan in one case and projects involving uh, the Indian Northeast uh, to move forward. Thank you. I think- uh, uh, Yeah, uh, thank you, Ambassador. And unfortunately, uh, we have nobody from uh, Bhutan uh, who could give us his view, but uh, can I request General Bastner, you know, this particular point that the ambassador made that bilaterally we are able to you know move forward but when we try to uh, get all four on board uh, then there are problems which arise so uh, uh, his his mention i use the word that there is a challenge in bringing uh, nepal and bhutan on board onto certain uh, you know projects uh, so anything uh, you, you would like to say on that well uh, uh, nepal in particularly like uh, Nepal being sensitive about uh, um, issues relating to um, uh, like um, energy. So it is, an, it is uh, the management of the resources that uh, Nepal needs to uh, not just get it to India, but uh, to get it to the third world. Like when Bangladesh usually brings out, like when I was in visit to the Dhaka also, they usually bring out issues of energy being uh, a resource that we all can share. So the importance, I think it is the importance of the trilateral agreement that has to come forth for sharing um, uh, and the uh, opportunities that every nation has, whether you are landlocked or whether you are uh, um, uh, seaborn or whatever. So I think the reservations, even in Nepal, that you find in in, in, in common, is uh, trying to use its resources so that Nepal benefits economically, and uh, and, and the region. So, like Nepal being try um, being a part of uh, sub-regional organizations where they can uh, be more exposed to the outer world, um, though it is uh, surrounded by India, is so what. Is in the um, is in the minds of uh, people. So, if Bibin could move forward with trilateral agreements, utilizing all the assets 
all the strong points of, let's say, Nepal or Bhutan. I mean, Bhutan has been, um, I mean, uh, uh, using its resources to uh, significance, but with certain compromises. But I don't think uh, Nepal's, uh, the population in Nepal would really like to go into that dynamic. But um, definitely Nepal would like to use its resources as fast as possible with trilateral agreements and would, would help Bibir, like as uh, Ambassador Farooq brought out. I mean, it is a sp project specific so that this particular Bibin uh, helps the uh, regional blocks move forward. You see. Whether it is active policy for India or whether it is Bimstake or whether it is uh, SART. You know. uh, so I would stress on the fact that India has to look into giving opportunities and using the resources available for landlocked countries so that uh, trilateral agreements are important to that. Sir, can I, can I just uh, say a few words? Uh, I would also like to say after you say, sir. Okay, okay, okay. First, uh, Jal Rahman and then Jal Ukhe. All right, sir. Thank you, sir. The point is about the energy, so uh, I thought that uh, a little bit of information would be quite beneficial. But before that, let me uh, say that the name of the China-India border that we've been talking about, where it terminated, the, it was Ruli border. The Ruli border, which is in the Yunnan province of uh, China. Uh, now, about the, about the energy cooperation, trilateral uh, agreement, on the energy cooperation. You see, energy cooperation is one of the cooperation which is so meaningful and so important, but yet least, you know, problem related to security, if we talk at all about security, in terms of traditional and non-traditional. It is electricity produced from one country, passes through a transmission line to another country or third country. I'm just giving you a very layman you know, example, but very essential example. Where is our concern should be? You see, Bangladesh imports 500 megawatt of power for, from India using the Bahrampur Helamara area of the north. And India, on the other hand, imports almost 80% of the total energy produced by Bhutan, uh, which is which produces roughly around 10,000 megawatt of power and uh, it has all the capacity of about 30,000 but it produces around 10,000 and uh, it domestic consumption is very less it's about 2,000 rest all 8,000 goes to India now India and Bhutan has a transmission line already existing and on the other hand Bangladesh and India also has a transmission line I was asked a question by one of the uh, diplomats of uh, you know Bhutan that why can't Bangladesh utilize the transmission line in India and get the you know powers or energy from Bhutan to Bangladesh. So you see, if you talk about this particular aspect, that uh, there are potential of uh, more energy production by the Bhutan, there are an existing you know transmission line. Maybe we have to enhance the capacity, but there is existing transmission line. And Bangladesh is also in dire need of, you know, electricity as good as like India. So what kind of security really uh, concerns to make a trade agreement in energy cooperation between Bhutan, India, and Bangladesh? I will not talk about Nepal, India, Bangladesh, because uh, there are questions because Nepal is still not in a state of producing a quantity of energy, hydro energy, which it can supply because it involves a huge amount of financial you know, support. But in this regards also, our government has already declared that Bangladesh will try to contribute as much as possible it can to develop the hydro potential of uh, uh, Nepal and for this maximize, for maximizing the uh, you know, benefit amongst the sub, uh, BVN countries. So if my request to the concern who approves or the policymakers, that if there is one effort made successful in 
connecting Bhutan to Bangladesh using the existing transmission line of India and get the electricity or power supply from Bhutan to Bangladesh, I think it will make a huge sense and it will give a true flavor of a sub-regional cooperation, which we had been desperately you know, expecting and looking for. Thank you, sir. Uh, firstly, uh, I would endorse most of what has been said by General, uh, but I would like to qualify it with two, three caveats. One is that energy uh, security is here we are looking at two upper riparian states, essentially Bhutan and Nepal, and India is the middle riparian, and then there is a lower riparian state, Bangladesh. So even when we do agreements with Nepal, there are issues because we want to do energy as well as flood control. And Nepal wants to liberate the fact that it is not able to use that water. It, it hardly can use it for irrigation. Similarly, Bhutan. So it would like to leverage it to the maximum extent possible. Now, as we know that hydroelectric projects in these uh, ecosystems, which are very fragile, need tremendous amount of land because they have to. They are in seismic zones. Uh, Nepal has had earthquake. Sikkim has got earthquake. And even within India, I am telling you, sir, allow me to submit to you to get a clearance for this kind of project is not easy. We've had history of uh, Chahri Dam and all these kind of issues are ecological mysteries. I can only give them a medal for their bureaucratic hurdle that they put it. Even our sensitive projects in border areas don't get environmental clearance so easily. So there are issues. But I do concede your point that as far as power grid is concerned, we should share it. We should develop uh, dedicated power grid. Why not? That's a wonderful concept, sir. I also agree that India must be alive to these sensitivities, allow more funding, and if it is possible to exploit more hydroelectric potential of, Bangla, uh, of Bhutan, uh, we should do it. But one catch which I always leave in interaction with Bhutan so Bhutanese uh, uh, speaker is Lobzang Dorji is not here, but I consider myself half Bhutanese because my core had the responsibility to look after the defense of Bhutan also. So uh, allow me to submit to you that Bhutan's overall policy in all dimensions, all facets, is governed by high impact, low engagement. It wants to get maximum value, like in tourism. It wants to have finite number of tourists paying uh, heavy premium, but it doesn't want to spoil its ecosystem. It wants to preserve it. That is their concept. Even India has not been able to prevail on them because Bhutan is not agreeing to endorse this motor vehicle agreement. Bhutan has got, and uh, today Bhutan is a democracy. When this agreement had gone to the parliament, the upper house opposition sat over it. They didn't pass it. Yeah. So, so, so it, is, it is not that easy. But I do take all your points, and I, uh, uh, in part, I agree with you, but I have also voiced the concern. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Jal uh, KJ. And, uh, you know, all the panelists have given their views on this particular matter. And uh, it mostly, in a large part, answers uh, two questions which were from uh, two of the pa participants, uh, that is from Samboj Chandra and from Tekraj Gorala, where both of them, uh, using maybe a little bit of different language, had asked that, why is it that, why can't we, you know, get better integrated? What are the problems? And because this is a point which was on everybody's mind, because uh, this is obviously something which, uh, to a layman, it, it layman or even a students, uh, some of them are students from the South Asian University. Uh, it uh, very clearly comes out that cooperation and integration will bring in uh, prosperity. So why are we not able to do it? And of course, uh, uh, what all the four speakers have said, uh, to a large measure answers, answers this question. Uh, the uh, Tekraj Korala had also asked that if we exclude Bhutan, will things become better? But that, I think, uh, if somebody from Bhutan had been there, 
uh, we would be uh, able to take on that question. And uh, in any case, Bhutan's objection, even to the MBA, they have said that from our side, we have no problem, you carry on with it. Uh, so uh, even if Bhutan is not, uh, it, it dilutes the, uh, you know, the, uh, the concept of BBIL. If Bhutan does not, if any of the countries done, uh, does not come on board any of the initiatives, but as far as the MBA is concerned, uh, it does not really, uh, you know, hamper it too much. Right. Uh, that is my view. And uh, now I will. Uh, uh, there are no more questions from uh, the uh, the participants, so I have some questions, and uh, I will uh, ask these. And I will, uh, Ambassador uh, Soban, I will uh, ask you the first question. Uh, India is a dominant member of BBIN as is, uh, you know, as it is in SARC. And in SARC, that has proved to be a challenge because there are others uh, which are not very happy with their dominance. And uh, in BBIN, such counterbalancing influence is uh, even lesser. And India's dominance in BBIN, again to a layman, uh, appears more pronounced. Is this counterbalancing required? Why is it required? And is such a counterbalancing a stumbling block or a facilitator to cooperation? Uh, thank you, Ambassador. Over to you. Well, uh, I can only speak, uh, General, uh, from my own uh, experience. Uh, I believe uh, and when we conceived of this idea of uh, BBIN, uh, initially as, as the growth quadrangle, uh, the central theme underlying the cooperation, as I mentioned, was we should look forward to doing specific projects linking uh, the four countries. Uh, one very important project, uh, which we had initially discussed and which was mooted by the Asian Development Bank was uh, to adopt the Mekong Delta model and go in for basin-wide uh, cooperation. Uh, as you know, uh, Nepal, Bhutan, India, Bangladesh, uh, uh, we share uh, common water resources. Uh, Nepal, Bhutan, as you mentioned, uh, is, is the upper riparian. The India is in the middle and we are the lower riparian. Uh, this uh, basin-wide cooperation, I think, could offer enormous benefits in terms of uh, the optimum utilization of the, the water resources. Water, as we know, is going to be one of the major uh, shall I say, challenges uh, in, in the coming uh, decade. And uh, to me, uh, the key to BBIN cooperation is this basin-wide cooperation among the four BBIN countries. In order, frankly, for this to materialize, uh, we need uh, the support and cooperation and agreement uh, of India. Uh, I had also made a reference uh, in my comments to uh, India's uh, reservations about multilateral investments in BBIN uh, projects, including reservations about foreign direct investment in BBIN projects. So as of now, uh, India is, is geographically, as well as in terms of its own intrinsic strength and size, uh, uh, is the uh, country that really determines the intensity, the pace, and the nature of the cooperation within the BBIN framework. And, uh, Whereas India has been quite willing to, uh, to see a bilateral cooperation uh, move forward, uh, a lot of India's uh, interests have been uh, uh, 
uh, addressed uh, particularly by Bangladesh in the area of connectivity. Uh, we need to see more progress involving uh, Nepal and Bhutan so that uh, BBIN is uh, something which uh, benefits uh, all the four countries. Uh, for Bangladesh, uh, it is very important that uh, we would like to see uh, uh, improved connectivity for Nepal and Bhutan uh, through India to, to Bangladesh. I think that is, uh, we see that as an intrinsic part of the connectivity process. So the ball really on so many different issues rests in the uh, port of India. And uh, it is really up to India to decide how best it would like to proceed in these matters. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Ambassador. And uh, now my next question, uh, and I would be asking this question from uh, General KJ Singh, uh, General Rahman, and General Basnet. And, uh, you know, like General Rahman said, uh, you know, all three army people or armed forces people, and uh, we always uh, think in terms of very quick solutions and very quick, uh, you know, uh, resolution of uh, issues. Uh, so I'm sure, uh, so if I put one question, it will, uh, you know, uh, it can be answered by all of you in context of your respective countries. If Bhutan had been there, I would have asked the same question of them. Or if uh, uh, somebody from Bhutan who had been from the uh, security field, of course, we had an uh, academic today, actually. Uh, I would have asked him the same thing. And after we have answered uh, these uh, questions, the three speakers have answered, uh, I will thereafter request uh, all the panelists if they want to add on anything in one minute, uh, you know, which they might have missed out earlier or which has come to their mind now, uh, I will give them time, one or two minutes for that. And thereafter, I will give my uh, a very brief concluding remarks. So the question which actually is through all three uh, is that national security issues are increasingly becoming an area of major concern, uh, which can put a break on regional or sub-regional integration, as we are seeing maybe here and in other parts of the world also. What national security issues do the BBIN countries have, which slowed down its development, the development of the BBIN? And uh, you can, uh, you know, give, give out both internal national security issues or external national security issues. Uh, so over to General KGC. Uh, thank you, Katoj. This is a very intelligent and uh, difficult question to answer. Uh, see, it sounds very simple, but it has got a lot of layers and layers within it. So if you start uh, from the internal side, India has challenges in terms of resolving its uh, insurgencies which are in Northeast. Now here I'd like to place on record actually my salute and appreciation for Bangladesh, for the, especially in particularly to the Prime Minister of Bangladesh. Because if insurgencies in India are finding resolution today, a large measure of that is because Bangladesh stopped giving shelter to the insurgents who were hiding there. Anup Chetia and Anthony Shimrang the weapon organizer of NSC and IM was living there. And it was during the time of Begum Khalida and others that he had Zia or uh, PM Zia there, 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 or President Zia, they were there. So Bangladesh is a very stabilizing influence for us. And we, I always say that India must remain very sensitive to Bangladesh's concerns because Bangladesh does so much for us that we should go extra mile. That is what I always recommend in India. Uh, to that extent, I get disappointed sometimes when a thing like uh, Faraka barrage and uh, enhancing water from Tista to flush out the silt which gets into Delta, like what Ambassador Subhan was trying to articulate, uh, doesn't receive the kind of cooperation and uh, assistance which, which it should receive. Uh, that's because of typical problems of federal, state, 
and west bengal now having the problems but i hope in better times we are able to take up these and we uh, continue to have excellent relations with bangladesh which helps us to redress uh, our internal security challenges there are challenges of dealing with narco terrorism uh, gun running and uh, smuggling of wildlife products uh, in this uh, our connectivity in this in these is more with myanmar and because these uh, rings operate through myanmar uh, through the yunnan province kunming ruili what uh, was being referred by general uh, he was uh, referring to those areas so that is another issue which needs to be taken up uh, as regards borders jal business has highlighted the borders with bangladesh are uh, semi hardened and there the issue is not really of any infiltration of any armed people it is basically because of cattle smuggling and also because of a certain amount of demographic challenges which uh, get thrown up but the way bangladesh economy is taking up i think uh, even if it may sound light hearted we we'll have to st- or bangladesh will have to start looking that but people from india don't start going there because after all economic hubs attract outside population so we have to uh, but uh, the borders are well uh, guarded with bangladesh we have to make them smarter we have to cooperate a little more on that our borders with nepal and bhutan are open uh, they they need to remain open with nepal we have that uh, ma roti ka rishta ya beti roti ka rishta as they say marriages take place and uh, livelihood is common and tarai region draws lot of linkages on this side so borders should remain open but they should become smart with surveillance because after all uh, there have been issues in bhutan of uh, bhupleys of people who were settled there there have been issues of uh, we had to launch an operation in uh, borders on borders of bhutan to flush out terrorists uh, we had to do that because uh, bodos and other other terrorists used to take shelter there and uh, overarching to the entire thing is the shadow of dragon how much uh, space you will allow to china and will you accommodate sensitivities of india that remains the overarching question that has to be addressed by each of us nobody is against china but china has its own interest and if they are going to be in a zero sum mode after all people are saying that in ladakh china came to teach india a lesson and show india its place and to rub india's nose so then india is not a country which is will allow its nose to be rubbed so easily it's a, it's a nation which is going to soon become the most populated nation in a, in a decade or two it's got young aspiring population its economy may be down because of pandemic but it is surely going to bounce back so to have such vision to that you will teach a lesson to such a country and keep it cap may not be a fair lesson to teach it is better lesson to teach that we have a win win syndrome we all can win we all can cooperate we all can share prosperity and uh, we can work in that mode with that i hope i have try i have partially because no question can get answered to me thank you jai hind thank you so much general kj and uh, uh, general abdul rahman uh, from your point of view on the same issue of course sir. thank thank you sir i would like to thank jan singh for acknowledging the uh, the contribution of bangladesh in not sharing any kind of or not giving any kind of space mm-hmm. to the insurgents it is not only for the case of india it is also for the case of myanmar so our government has specifically and very loudly said that our soil will not be allowed for any foreign insurgents or foreign terrorists bottom line is a zero tolerance and i bear the witness being a military general and it is not only that our government has said our government has meant it frankly speaking and trust me so 
this is one of the major you know indication from our government to our neighbors about our attitude about our desire of relationship with our neighbors our country does now believe very strongly that we have to prosper and we have to prosper together just giving one example that 226 billion us dollar can be earned if we can manage the energy within this sub region it's not a matter of joke it's a huge you know figure for the development now second thing that i would like to say is that uh, is, is pathetic from my side. That somewhere we had SARP, and then because of this, the question that uh, Chair, Mr. Chair has asked, that is the national security is becoming dominant and taking over the place over the development. To some extent, I think it is true. Because uh, SARC with a lot of hope and aspiration, some say that it has it is already dead. Some say it is already in ICU. It is in life support, but still it is alive. But then when we saw it's not really functioning as we expected, then the uh, uh, ambassador for Subhan Sar has said how the concept of BVI developed. And then within the BVI, and you see, then suddenly modification agreement when it has not been ratified by Bhutan, there has been noise or recommendation, opinion. Can we delete B and make it only BIM? So you see, we are shortening the you know, partners. So from SAR to BBN, from BBN, now we are, talk, we are thinking of BIN, Bangladesh, India, Nepal. Uh, so is the case with BCIMC. So BCIMC, Bangladesh, China, Myanmar, India. So when uh, there were problem object uh, or there were slowed down you know, initiative from the India, then there were proposals that came, can we discard the I? Can we make it BCM? Bangladesh, China, Myanmar, economy corridor. You see, uh, so things are not really, uh, you know, it does not really uh, go as we really dream so at the beginning. And to be very honest, yes, I strongly believe at times, the national security, which is being developed, which is being perceived, which is being in the plan by your respective country, it has a lot of impact on the regional you know, economic intrication. Now here I would like to bring one point, where being a military man, I will say we are very free and frank. This China syndrome is a problem and it will remain a problem. Now, what happened here, uh, the, the larger partners, the bigger partners, I would rather suggest that they should discuss more of common interests than disagreement or differences. But we see we are more concerned about the differences than the common issues. If we emphasize on the common issues of common interest with win-win situation, Gradually, perhaps at one point of time, we can mitigate or you know, minimize at least the security issues which are bothering to some, some of the countries. And <clears throat> here I must say that country like Bangladesh or for the Nepal or Sri Lanka or Bhutan, you know, frankly speaking, we are sandwiched between China and India. If we give some preferences to China, India becomes very unhappy. Next day we give some preference to China, India, China becomes unhappy. What we should go. But we are open for everybody. Everybody is our friend. Can we discard China? No, it's impossible. Can we, can we say that no India because we can't. And we always say that you can choose your partner, but you cannot, you cannot choose your neighbor. We have to live with the neighbors. We are, the, the India is our neighbor. We have to live with India. And in this current world, can not only Bangladesh, can any you know, country really discard China? Can America itself discard China, which is having so much of you know, tussles? The reality is that we, we don't know 
where what we really want we have to make a decision that we really want the economic emancipation and development of the country and the people if it is so i can bet the security issues can be handled security issues can be handled. At, at time we over securitize the security issues this is what is my personal opinion bangladesh is a classical example it how it can open its door for economic development and for giving support to the regional countries or the neighboring countries is still maintaining its national security both traditional and non traditional so i would say that if my words are taken by the policy maker that if china and india become a little more closer than apart i think much of the problem of the entire not only the bbn region the entire region of south asian region can be you know change the whole picture will change 21st century is asian century asia has the largest you know young manpower asia is the fastest growing economy of the world all this you know at times become very you know disappointing that probably this situation this scenario will not remain for long it will change it will change if our existing serious citizens does not take a right decision today perhaps we will leave a darker future for our future generation this is the time that we should catch the train will leave exactly at 7 o'clock if it is scheduled it will not leave at 7 past 1 past 7 so we have to board into the train at 7 o'clock there is no point coming to the rail station to board in at 1 past 7 so i think this is the right time Let's analyze our security, national security, and then compromise a little bit or mitigate this in, in the security issues, or you know, resolve the security issues in some other way, and make space for the economic development, economic integration, cooperation, and work on the common issues, and let's deal the disagreements later. Mostly, India. and china the two power of asia this is what i have to say thank you sir thank you general rahman and uh, now over to general bastiat and of course uh, what general rahman has said about uh, living with neighbors in the case of nepal uh, it is maybe a little more uh, you know uh, relevant and difficult also so over to general bastiat yeah let me let me flip back to my presentations when i Uh, covered the doctrinal imperative. One was a change to geography. One was second. One was a diverse geopolitical situation. The third was great power rivalry. The fourth was geopolitics compulsions, and the uh, the other one was the resource competition. So the so these are um, uh, imperatives that is driving small nations and uh, into complexities. You know? and and as um, uh, general rahman uh, brought out that uh, this is the, uh, the india china uh, now entering into the third sea confrontation is a dilemma and um, but we have to live with it and we have to find ways and solutions how we go about it so let me let just highlight two of uh, two things on this on uh, relating to national security one is the uh, resource uh, competition the, the hydro politics is going to move even more than what it is today it is being well observed you know like how almost uh, the most of the river sources or the water sources come from tibet like for south asian i mean seven of south asian's greatest rivers uh, is forming the largest rivers come from uh, tibet of china and 46% of the world population depends upon rivers that have have what headwaters uh, including for nepal including the ganges so this is one thing that we really have to look forward to solving both for fresh water irrigation and energy so this is one side and there is and the second the resources that brings about um, like let's say the um, Uh, china and uh, india is the um, rem the rare earth minerals like 
so these are other issues also, but uh, let, let us know, not go deep into that. But, um, and the second thing about is the security concern. Like when I brought out the issue about Himalayan range having uh, problems like from Arunachal Pradesh to Ladakh, it is not just related with uh, a confined in a certain area. So the whole Himalayan belt is going to have or going to face certain consequences on this. And for Nepal, when I talk about the border management, now the border management needs to be more um, or, or needs to be more thought of than uh, what we really had in the, uh, the existing system. Like um, for Nepal, um, I mean, lying in the uh, 1400, let's say 40 kilometers and uh, Northeast in the Himalayas and, um, and the, uh, the, the geopolitical trends is that uh, the North-South strategic connections is coming, um, is uh, being formed. And the sensitivities in the uh, East, uh, Northeast section of uh, the disputed area, the Kalapani area in Nepal, which just came out a few months back on, and the parliament of Nepal endorsed it as being part of Nepal's territory. And the other side is if you go to the uh, uh, Northwest, uh, towards the Siliguri corridor or the chicken neck is the uh, district of uh, Taplism, which is just about 45, I think 42 to 45 kilometers from the Chinese border. So these are sensitivities of, uh, so when I brought out the issue of border, we were talking about uh, the military maneuvering and how Nepal could, or other let's say, nations could assist in still maybe being a buffer, which we had remained. So these are issues of uh, national security. And for Nepal, I see, uh, I see like two choices. One is either invest, which is a question, on security capabilities. Okay, uh, getting the army the most modern, or getting the security agencies involved in the security matters, and with an argument of uh, financial uh, constraints. Second is finding a political and uh, diplomatic resolution. Like I remember in 1975, King Birendra uh, brought out a, a proposal of a zone of peace during his co coronation, uh, which was endorsed by 100 and, uh, uh, I mean, quite a few countries, but uh, was not able to materialize. So these type of resolutions may be things that we look in the, I will look into for national security and regional security so that we get integrated, economically integrated, so that we use our resources for the benefits of the people of South Asia. Uh, thank you so much, uh, General Bastian. Now, now we are into the last about eight minutes of our uh, session. And uh, like I mentioned, I will re uh, request in case any of the parts, uh, the, uh, the panelists has to just uh, take one minute, 30 seconds, one minute to say, uh, give any message. Uh, so I'll request you to stick to that timing. Uh, Ambassador Stroba. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, there's much that I uh, would like to endorse in the uh, comments just made by the other panelists, uh, particularly my countryman, General Abdul Rahman. Uh, I think we, we are facing at the moment some uh, very uh, serious challenges uh, in terms of the, the prevailing uh, geopolitical environment. Uh, uh, I should, uh, we have managed to go through uh, nearly uh, two hours without uh, mentioning the COVID pandemic and the impact uh, that this has had and is having and will continue to have uh, on our economies. Uh, to me, uh, this has uh, further intensified uh, the need for uh, regional cooperation, sub-regional cooperation, uh, indeed economic integration itself. Uh, what I 
what is going to be extremely important for all our countries in this uh, very difficult environment is to attract foreign direct investment. Uh, you know, Bangladesh has a, a plan, uh, the Vision 2041 plan, which envisages uh, during the next uh, 20 years, uh, something in the region of $250 billion of FDI. Uh, to me, this is uh, going to be very difficult to achieve uh, without uh, improving our infrastructure, but without improving our infrastructure, as well as integrating our infrastructure, particularly our road and rail network, uh, in the region, extending it uh, beyond uh, to also connect with uh, ASEAN and, and China and the subcontinent as, as a whole. So these are challenges which we have to face. Uh, I think General Rahman has uh, uh, articulated uh, the importance uh, for Bangladesh uh, to maintain uh, the best of relations uh, with uh, India and our neighbors, uh, but at the same time also uh, continue our cooperation uh, with China. Uh, we frankly would like nothing better than to see uh, some uh, degree of uh, reconciliation, uh, if that is the right word, between uh, India and, and, uh, and China that will be to the benefit of of all the countries uh, in the region. Uh, but we would like uh, to uh, be able to attract uh, investment uh, from globally in some very, uh, I would say, important critical uh, infrastructure projects, connectivity projects, energy projects, as well as uh, projects related to the development of our joint water resources. I think that is the challenge uh, which we face and I hope we can achieve it, whether it is through BBIN or other regional and sub-regional groupings. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. And uh, General Kejo Singh, 30 seconds now because we are actually now running out of time. 30 seconds, anything uh, you want to say? Thank you, Jal Katoch. I just want to say that a couple of years back, Bangladesh, uh, sorry, Bhutan brought out an issue of gross domestic happiness. And a lot of people laughed. They said Bhutan has got nothing else to do. So it is talking of happiness. But today, gross national well being has become indeed a key parameter for national security. And this region must look at these challenges, work together. And I would implore the nations. To, while India is a bigger nation, but in your game of balancing, uh, you can't always blame the bigger nation. You have to look at the sensitivity of that bigger nation also. So with this message that balance, you must balance, but balance with India's concern. Thank you. Jai Hind. Thank you so much, General KJ. Uh, General Rahman, 30 seconds, please. I'll take 25 seconds now. Okay. Uh, since uh, my teacher has already concluded, and I being a Bangladeshi, I don't get to, uh, you know, uh, put anything else. So all that uh, uh, Mr. Prince wants to say, I fully support it. And I would just like to add one one recommendation in addition to what you said is that I would recommend a cross-border steering committee may be instituted to facilitate the multilateral dialogue on how and what needs to be done to overcome the bottleneck and it should be on a regular basis. Thank you. Thank you so much, General. Uh, General Basnet. Yeah, since uh, like um, I was talking about the border issue, so creating a, a safer uh, border uh, security environment, I would like to stress on um, the things that I said. I mean, we must have an integrated mechanisms of looking into the threats of uh, like sharing of information, like apprehensions and inter interdictions of uh, methods of migrations like um, and how to how to make like travels and safety like and and the standardizing of uh, secure 
identification so that i mean national identifications so that we know particularly that uh, 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 threats within us is not used against other nations yeah, thank you thank you so much jan bastian and uh, now uh, i'll conclude by firstly thanking uh, uh, nice for giving us this platform i will thank the panelists uh who have uh, been very erudite and very uh, brief and to the point and we are finishing almost dot on the clock and uh, i would just like to uh, finish off by saying that for the bbi and initiative to achieve success it is important to calibrate the speed and level of its ambitions it must be recognized that even within the bbi and group there are significant differences in terms of economic size and level of economic development as we are all very well aware therefore the political objectives and policy priorities of these countries might be quite different and of course this came out very uh, you know very clearly uh, in the various presentations of the panelists the long term acceptability and success of the bbin will depend on how well the concerns of its partner countries are taken up within the framework so and of course today we uh, you know we uh, heard a lot about the concerns of course we we sorely missed the a participant from bhutan because the bhutanese concerns we are aware of it by you know reading about it and thing like that but when a panelist comes and talks about it it becomes that much more live and of course i'll end by saying that connectivity is the new global currency for growth and prosperity and it secures both trade and energy lines and uh, uh, you know general raman brought out the amount of uh, i think 226 billion dollars he had uh, mentioned just for energy so it can really really be of great help and uh, it's uh, these energy lines for countries uh, they are so important and we must make the best of our geographic advantages uh, we can't choose our neighbors we can't uh, change our geography but we must make the best of our geographic advantages it is 10:45 and we are not on the clock low. and thank you so much thank you so much for being part of this panel thank you sir thank you oh, thank, thank you, you thank you so much thank you Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Distinguished chair, speakers, ladies and gentlemen, as we have come to the end of this session, we would like to express our sincere gratitude and thanks to the chair for agreeing to chair and moderate the session today. A sincere thanks also goes to all the speakers for being a part of the event and delivering such comprehensive and convincing presentations. We would like to acknowledge our gratitude to our friends from the diplomatic community, experts, academia, media and different organizations. Finally, we must also mention our deep sense of appreciation for the audience who participated in the webinar and those who are watching us live. Thank you for your valuable time and attention and for making this session productive with your questions. Once again, we are truly honored to have you all with us today. Please do join us in the next session. Thank you.